Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. We are looking at Psalm 117 in its entirety. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. This is God's word. Amen. Please be seated. It is good to be with you. Um, my first time ever coming to Chicago was 30 years ago, and uh, my wife and I were invited to look at Chicago with the possibility of planting a church, joining your church planting network here. And uh, the Lord instead redirected us to stay in Orlando, and we were in Orlando for uh, another 16 years planting a church. And then, after we'd been there planting a church for about four years, you sent someone to us, Chuck and Debbie Holiday came and, uh, to Orlando and uh, was one of the pastors. I think he was here for like 20 years, weren't they? Something like that, quite a long time. And so some of you may have known them, and they came and uh, planted another church. And so we got to work alongside them, which was, uh, which was, a, which was a great privilege to, uh, to serve with uh, Chuck and Debbie as they planted a church on one end of town, and we were on the other end of town. And then for the last 16 years, we've been in Colorado Springs at, uh, at a church there and uh, just joined a Mission to the World where our passion continues to be church planting and seeing it uh, uh, throughout, throughout the world. And um, there's just so many great needs. There's a, a group of people who live in Syria and Iraq known as the Yazidi. Uh, the Yazidi are uh, people that have had to flee their homeland and have gone to Kurdistan. And the reason why is because when ISIS uh, came in and took over their land in, in 2018, they began to assault the young girls and young women. They began to murder people indiscriminately, and that's because the, 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 the ISIS people consider the Yazidis to be infidels. That's because the Yazidi religion uh, is a mixture of, of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, with a few other things thrown in. And so ISIS came in and just began to slaughter the people, and so they fled to uh, refugee camps throughout Kurdistan. And we're in several different uh, camps there. We're working. In one of the refugee camps was an Egyptian doctor. She also happened to be part of a Presbyterian church in Egypt started by our missionaries. And she's just there doing the work of, of medicine. But she, as she's doing it, she begins to share with them the good news of Jesus. And some of these people began to come to faith in Christ. And this Egyptian doctor knew this American businessman who was over there also, who also happened to be part of a Presbyterian church here in America, PCA church. And together, they began to start discipling these new believers, 15 to 20 people. But they realized this was beyond what they could handle. God was beginning to move. God was bringing people to, to faith. And they said, you know, we need help. And so they contacted Mission to the World and said, please send us some help. And so what's been happening over the last couple of years, people have been going from Egypt to, uh, to Kurdistan when the pandemic allowed to go in and disciple uh, the people there of this church and to teach them and to train them. But, but they realize that that can't work for long. You know, we, we need somebody there. We need, we need missionaries there on the ground. Here are people, the Yazidi, who, who something like 0.11% of these people are Christians. And yet God is working, bringing them to himself. And, and there's a great, great need for missionaries, but there aren't any missionaries to go. Not enough. As Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send workers into the harvest field. Now, I know you may be thinking at this point, well, that's interesting. You know, I've never heard of the Yazidi, at least I'd never heard of the Yazidi people. And that might be interesting, but we're here in Chicago. They're over there in Kurdistan. I'm not sure how this relates to me and to what we're supposed to do with our lives. Well, that's... Uh, question about how this relates to us is answered in this short little psalm, Psalm 117. Now before we look at the psalm, a couple of little points of trivia doesn't help you understand the psalm anymore, but I just think it's interesting. This is the shortest psalm in the Bible, shortest chapter in the Bible. It's two chapters away from the longest chapter in the Bible, which is Psalm 119. And not only that, but it is the 595th chapter in the Bible. I did not count. I took somebody else's word for that. And you say, well, what's the significance of 595? Well, actually, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible, which means this is the exact middle chapter. 
So what's at the heart of the Bible? What's at the very, very center, the central chapter of the entire Bible, at least as we have it laid out in the English language, this psalm. And this psalm is, praise the Lord, all nations, extol him, all people. Now, the psalms were the hymn book of the people of God, which means this brief little psalm was an early praise chorus going back a few thousand years that the people of God would sing in worship. But notice this, that, that they are singing in worship to God, but who are they singing to? They're not merely singing to God. Who are they singing to? They're singing to the nations. We're called, we're called to sing to the nations. Or being someone who grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, home of Coca-Cola, this is the heart of, I'd like to teach the world to sing. This is the song we want to teach the world to sing. So, so we're singing to the nations. So why are we singing to the nations? Well, the first reason we see that we sing to the nations is we sing to the nations because God loves us. Notice the rationale for why we're singing. The rationale is given in verse 2. For great is his steadfast love towards us. Now that word steadfast love uh, is a very popular word in the Old Testament. It appears 250 times. Uh, it is the Hebrew word, one of the few Hebrew words I can remember from seminary is the Hebrew word hesed. And uh, the word hesed uh, can be translated in a number of different ways, but it means covenant loyalty, uh, faithful love, uh, but it's, it's not just love, it's steadfast love. It's not merely kindness, it's dependable kindness. It's that, it's that love that will not let you go. It's that love that never says die, that love that never gives up. Often it's referred to love in action. In fact, uh, it, it oftentimes refers to the stronger party who comes to the aid of someone who's in dire straits. So when you read that steadfast love, it's that rescuing, never give up, never quit kind of love. Furthermore, the psalm does not merely say that God's love is steadfast, but it says that it's active. It's an active love. Literally, it says God's love has prevailed over or protected us. Or as Eugene Peterson, I think, beautifully interprets, translates it, he says, his love has taken over our lives. Here's why we're singing to the nations. is God's love has taken over our lives. God's not... This little grandfather who's looking at his grandchildren and smiling back, uh, grinning, and without getting up and without uh, pursuing, uh, he is a God who's actively pursuing, actively prevailing, actively protecting. He is going after them relentlessly. He is the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to go search for that one sheep and who will not give up and he will not quit until he brings that sheep home. That is the love of God. That is what Jesus has done for us. He left the glory of heaven, he took on human flesh, he entered our world, and he died for the very people who despised him. He, he died for those while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And as a result, he took those of us who were once enemies, and he made us his friends. Now the second half of verse 2 echoes the first. By the way, that's oftentimes how poetry in the Psalms work, two lines saying something very similar. And the second half says this, it says, just as God's steadfast love has overtaken our lives, that God's faithfulness endures forever. Now we're kind of accustomed to a love that starts off hot, flaming hot, flaming passion, and then kind of wanes over time. You know, the fires kind of, kind of die down. We are accustomed to love that, uh, that, that, that fades over time. Uh, you know, we, we live in a world with divorce, broken friendships, strained family relationships, in other words, love typically doesn't endure, at least through much in our world. But here it says that God's love endures forever. It is a love you cannot earn. You cannot keep it on your own. See, see God does not love you because you're measuring up. That's not how it begins the Christian life. That is not how we continue in the Christian life. God's love is based on his steadfast love alone. It is not based on you at all. A number of years ago, a young couple came to see me in my office, and uh, you could tell that uh, things were not well. He was upset. Uh, I knew this young man you know, fairly well. He was, um, I say he was a young man. I was a young man at the time, too, frankly, just a couple of years older. And uh, he, was, um, he was just your typical great church kid, you know, growing up. A youth group, 
went to a Christian college, actually one down the road here, uh, kind of well known. He uh, um, uh, always did what was right. He was in church most Sundays. You know, he was, he was model church boy, right? He, I mean, he was just the, just a perfect church kid, but he had something in his life that he kept hidden from everyone. He kept hidden from his wife. And one day, uh, they were getting up, going to work. Each of them were going to work, and he was getting dressed. And when she left, he was sitting on the couch putting on his socks. She came home that evening. He was still sitting in the exact same place, one sock on, one sock off. He had not moved all day. His eyes were swollen with tears. He was just weeping. She came home, found him just in the same spot, and she said, what's wrong? And he said, I've got something I've got to tell you. And he told her this thing that had just, the shame was just overwhelming and crushing. And so they came and, they, you know, they met with me and uh, we're sitting there talking and I had to, you know, I'm a pastor, I have to tell you the truth, right? I can't, it doesn't help for me to not tell them the truth. So I've got to tell them the truth and said, you know, I've got to tell you something. And uh, this can be really hard for you to believe. God loves sinners. And before, up until now, you, you thought you were like this little bitty sinner. Now you actually realize you really are a sinner. You've actually been honest about your sin. I want you to know something. God loves sinners. He loves you. It's not about you. It's about his steadfast love. And, and, and as he began to understand this, for the first time, see, before he'd been playing this little Christian game, like, yeah, God loves me, but I perform well. At least I, people think I perform well. But now that the performance had been stripped away and he couldn't stand on his own record at all, certainly not before God and not even before his wife or anyone else, for the first time he's fully exposed, fully exposed in all of his sin, and for the first time he saw himself as a real sinner and Jesus as a real Savior. See, it's when you begin to see the depth and reality of your sin, that you begin to see the reality of God's grace. And, and you'll never, you know, here's the thing, you'll never really understand God's steadfast love for you unless you're first honest about your sin. But ironically, you know, it's really tough to be honest about your sin unless you're also convinced of God's steadfast love for you. So it gave him the security. And so once you begin to see that this is what God's love is like, this is what Hesed is, uh, then we begin to sing about it to the nations. Because God has so loved us, uh, it, it's, then we want to share it. And so what, what missions is, it's not cultural imperialism. Our, our goal is not to go and make everybody like us, far be it from that. That's not what we're seeking to do. Our mission is not to coerce other people to live the way of lives that we live. It's just the opposite. The story we have to tell is that we were lost, but now are found that we too were far from God, but God out of love pursued us. When we were least deserving, his love prevailed over us. And even when we've been unfaithful to him, he's always been faithful to us. This is what our God is like now. And out of his love, he sent us to tell the world so that you might know of his steadfast love as well. We're not testifying to our goodness and how we have it together. We're testifying to his grace for people who don't have it together. That's something to sing about. And so we sing to the world because we know God's love for us. Secondly, we sing to the nations because God loves them, because God loves them. The psalm is a call to worship not just for the people of God, but it's a call to worship for the nations. Now that raises a question, and if you were here for the Sunday school class, Dale touched on this, who are the nations? Who are the nations? And so. You know, we have a, um, a tendency, uh, especially those of us who are part of the majority culture, uh, to, to look at the nations through a particular lens. The word nations in, in, in the Greek is the word ethne, which we get the word ethnic from. And so we, uh, we have a tendency to look at the nations where we're at the center and then the nations are everybody else. So, so picture a world map. How do you picture a world map? What's at the very center? We are, right? Of course, we're the center of the world. There's the U.S., and then there's the world. And so there's us, and then there's the nations. And, and that's how we, we tend to view things. Uh, and so, or consider how we use the word ethnic. 
Now again, ethnic, the word for, uh, for uh, you know, that's used for nations, we, we talk about ethnic food. And so we talk about Mexican food and Chinese food and, and kimchi and Middle Eastern food and things like that. And the message is clear. If you're non-white, you're ethnic. But if you're white, you're not ethnic. We're white, right? Do you see, you see the mentality here? Do you see, do you see how that begins to, to, to warp our thinking in a, in a particular way as I'm normal and, uh, and you're ethnic? And so, and so now that might sound trivial, but what it does is it causes us to put ourselves at the center of God's plan and everybody else on the margins. But now let's read Psalm 117 from a biblical perspective, not from our own cultural perspective. So from a biblical perspective, when Psalm 117 is being sung, who's singing it? It's the nation of Israel. Who are the ethne? Us, everyone who's not an Israelite, all the other nations, all the, all the people of the world. And so, so we're the ethnic people, no matter what our particular ethnicity is today. So just as, and the problem was though, just as we have our own ethnic biases today, the Israelites did as well. After all, they're the chosen people of God, right? We are God's people, you're not. <laughs> but that wasn't the point, was it? When God chose the nation of Israel, he did not choose them instead of the nations. He chose the nation of Israel for the sake of the nations. And in Israel, we see throughout their history, had forgotten this, that they were to be a light to the nations. And we see this from the very beginning. So God calls Israel, the Israelites, the Jews, to be his chosen people in Genesis chapter 12. It's where we have this, this great call. And where, where God comes to Abraham and he says, I will be a God to you and to your people. And I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And then he gives this promise. And then he says, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So do you, do you see the thrust? God says, I'm calling you Abraham and I'm calling your descendants, but I'm not calling you instead of the nations. I'm calling you so that through you, I will bring salvation to all the ethnic people of the world, to every ethnicity. In fact, this promise is so emphatic that God repeats it five times in the book of Genesis. Now listen, if you, somebody repeats something five times, it's important. Kids, a little tip. If your mom tells you to clean up your room five times, you better get the room cleaned up. I mean, she means business. If it's repeated five times, it's significant. And yet in Genesis 12, you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 18, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 22, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 26, and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 28, and in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God's, what's your point? Oh, all the nations of the earth are supposed to be blessed through us. That's the mission of God. That's the mission of the people of God. It was God's plan all along. And, and that's why uh, it should not surprise us when Nicodemus, you remember when Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and Jesus explains the gospel to him and he says, for God so loved Israel that he gave his only begotten son. It's not what he said, was it? He said, for God so loved the world. So God so loved the world, people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. God so loved the world, and so should we. The mission of the people of God from the very beginning to end is to the nations. So let me say the obvious. If we're going to sing to the nations, we have to go to the nations. If we're going to sing to the nations, you have to go to the nations. And, and we see this uh, in a sense in that where Psalm 117 makes this implicit, Jesus makes explicit in Matthew 28. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The mission that Jesus gives to his church is to take the gospel to all the ethne, to all the nations of the earth. Jesus does not merely tell us to engage in evangelism, although that's important, but to make disciples of the nation. And this mission that Jesus has given to his church is not an appendix to an already 
uh, already full mission. I understand how a church works. Been pastor for 30 years. You have your youth ministry, your worship ministry, your children's ministry, your women's ministry, your men's ministry, and oh, okay, and then we have missions ministry. It's just one of those little things. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says the mission of the church, the mission of the church is to make disciples of all nations. In fact, Jesus restates it or uh, is phrased it differently in Acts chapter 1. He says that we are to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. That is the mission of the church. As I mentioned, I, I, um, I was a church planter. I have a passion for church planting. I've been involved in church planting all my adult life, um, either as a church planter or starting daughter churches or um, uh, you know, being involved in church planning networks, starting church planning networks. Chuck Holiday and I got to work on starting the church planning network in Orlando. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we have a passion for that. And um, on Tuesday, I was, uh, Dale and I were in, in Chattanooga, and we got to meet for breakfast and for lunch with some church planters in, uh, in Chattanooga. And between the appointments with the church planters, we met with a missionary going to Baku, Azerbaijan. How many of you had ever heard of Baku before? Somebody. Okay, one. Okay, I had to Google it. I, I'd never heard of Baku. It's a city of about five to six million people. Never heard of it. World-class city. And, uh, but, and uh, you know, it's just uh, it's there on the Caspian Sea. It has some beautiful European architecture, a little bit of Russian influence, a little Middle Eastern, a little bit of everything there. Uh, but the, in Baku, less than 3% of the people profess to be Christian of any stripe, only 0.2% are evangelical Christians. And the thing is, you know, this missionary can't go and do this work alone. You know, we, we, need, we need a few more people if we're going to reach Baku. Uh, and, and as a you know, former church plant, I was just struck by this, though. I, Chattanooga is the most church city in America. And I'm meeting with these church planters who have, like, more, six of them going on right now, the most church city in America. And I'm going, and Baku, we've got nothing. Now, I'm not saying we stop planting churches in Chattanooga or we shouldn't plant churches in Chicago. I don't think Chicago's reached yet. But, but don't you see the, 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 the strange distribution of resources? I mean, is it just? Is it right? When we see you know, zero in Baku, and yet six in Chattanooga and in Colorado and, 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 and other places of the world. Let me just be blunt. I have a hard time being blunt. Just kidding. Um, can we really say, can we really say that we are being faithful to the Great Commission when the Great Commission is to take the gospel to all nations, when the overwhelming majority of our resources are going to reach people in groups that are already reached. Is that faithfulness to the Great Commission? When the mission has been called to go to the ends of the earth, have we forgotten? Have we forgotten what our Lord told us to do? 2,000 years after he gave us this mission. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And as those who know this love, we've now been commissioned by God to share it with the world. We sing because God loves us, and we want others to know about it, and we sing because God loves the world. And then finally, we sing to the nations because we love God. God loves us. God loves the world. We love God. Therefore, we engage in his mission. Uh, we love God, and we want God to receive the glory that is due his name. The reason we come to worship on Sunday mornings and the reason we worship throughout the week is we believe God deserves it. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God deserves glory? Thank you. There's someone who's not Presbyterian here, and I appreciate you, brother. Uh, is, you know, but do you believe it? Seriously. Five people believe this. Okay. Uh, yes, I believe it, right? You believe it. I, I really do. I believe God deserves the glory. And so, and so because God deserves the glory, and for all he's done, we come, we, we, we sing, and we pray, and we praise him, and and, and we long for him to get the credit because it's unjust when someone doesn't get credit for what they do. God deserves the credit. He deserves the glory. Uh, Colorado Springs is home to the Olympic Committee and the Olympic Training Center. So we actually have Olympic athletes in our city. And sometimes we'll be running in our park and uh, Olympic athlete will run by. So I tell people that I run with Olympic athletes um, for like one second. Um, 
My cross the street neighbor, uh, when, when I first met him, found out he won a gold medal. I mean, if I won a gold medal, I'd wear that thing everywhere I went. You know, people go, what's that around your neck? Oh, that old thing, oh, just a gold medal one in Sydney, you know. He was a wrestler. But the thing is, at the Olympics at first, he got the silver medal. He got the silver medal, and the reason is, I got the silver medal, the one who got the gold medal was the Russian. You knew it, didn't you? It was the Russian. The Russian got the, the, the gold medal in wrestling. It turned out the Russian had cheated. He'd been using steroids. And so later on, after they'd had their award ceremony, they gave my neighbor the gold medal. And I said, wow, that's impressive. I go, wait, don't you feel a little ripped off? Like, who got to stand on the top of the podium? The Russian. Who got his national anthem played? The Russian. And I'm like, I'm like angry. I go, this isn't right. This is unjust. It should have been, you should have been there. You should have gotten the anthem. And he goes, Mark, I got the gold medal, you know. He wasn't worried about it, but I was. I was jealous for his glory. That was his glory. That should have been his moment. And, and as Christians, we got to be jealous for the glory of God, that all nations should join in praising him. And, and so we go to the nations because we love God and we long to see him receive the glory due his name. And the other thing is, whenever you find delight in something, C.S. Lewis points this out. He says, when you find delight in something and you enjoy it, you naturally praise it. Like you're eating, Sam, Sam's taking us around to eat some great food in Chicago. And when you eat it, you go, oh, this is so good. I mean, that's not like a duty response. Oh, it's time to say, oh, it's so good. I mean, it's just like, it's what comes out. And then when you eat something really good and someone else isn't eating it, what do you do? Oh, you got to try this. Oh, you got to try this. It's something you know, because our enjoyment of it, Lewis observes, is increased by sharing it with others. Uh, our joy, it, 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 part of the joy is inviting others to share in that joy. I have three great loves. I love my Lord. I love my family. And I love Krispy Kreme donuts. Sometimes not in that order. And, um, and so I just, do they have Krispy Kreme here? Okay, I, it's, Colorado people don't like them because they're so stinking healthy and um, it's depressing. Um, they eat kale, you know. It's, uh, but I love Krispy Kreme donuts. And, and so one time we were doing this thing at our church when I was in Orlando, and I was talking to this, this woman. We had this children's event. We're cleaning up, and she said she never had a Krispy Kreme donut. I said, you're kidding. She goes, no. You know, she said, actually, I had one once from the grocery store, and it just wasn't that good. I said, no, 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 no. you got to go when the hot sign's on. And she goes, what? I said, the hot sign is on this afternoon from 4 to 6. The fact that I knew that off the top of my head is really sad. Uh, but I, actually, I did. And, and, and you can go there right now, and it's a mile down the road. And she said, I'm, I'm like, I'm offering to drive her to get a Krispy Kreme donut. Why? Because I know as soon as she eats that hot donut coming off the conveyor belt where it drips the, the stuff on it, and she puts that in her mouth, it's going to melt in her mouth, and she's going to praise me forever. I know I will have changed her life. She's going to enjoy it so much. Now, why don't I do that with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do I really believe it's that sweet and that good and that delightful? We have a world out there has never tasted his goodness. Half the people. They're, they're, they're living with no access to the gospel at all. They don't even know a Christian. They don't even know a person who knows a person who knows Jesus. They are never going to hear the name of Jesus. They're never going to taste the sweetness. They're never going to know his love. It, it, they're never going to know about his steadfast love. What we know, how our lives have been changed, and God has given us the privilege of sharing that good news with others. And because we love God, we want others to enjoy in that. And so we do it not out of duty. Certainly it is our duty, but we don't do it merely out of duty. We do it out of, as those whose hearts have been gripped by the sweetness of Christ. The Puritan Thomas Manton said, the more you believe God to be gracious, the more you'll want to please him. The more you get the gospel in your life and really believe it is sweet and tasty and good and beautiful, the more you're going to want to share that for others. Now, as, as those who know the love of God, let me permit, just permit me to ask you to do one thing. I'm only going to ask you to do one thing. And that is, I'm going to ask you to pray that God would show you 
how you can be involved in this mission. By the way, the chorus is something, we, it's not a solo, it's something we sing together, so we're, we do this mission together. But, but what's your part? What's your role? And, and, say, and just pray, say, Lord, here's my life. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll learn what you want me to love. I'll, I'll, I'll learn, I'll give what you want me to give. Will you offer your life to God and say, Lord, this is your mission and I love you and you've called me to be part of it and I want to be part of it. So Lord, here's my life, take it. That's kind of a frightening prayer, isn't it? There's a woman we were talking to the other night. She's just one time someone had challenged her and said, hey, I want you to pray about going to Madrid. She said, no, I'm not going to pray that. You know why she didn't want to pray that? Because God might call her to go to Madrid. Now, what does that tell you about our thoughts about God? If I say, God, here's my life, do with it whatever you want, he's going he's to make you miserable because God's goal in life is actually to make you miserable. That's the kind of God he is, right? What did Jesus say about prayer? He said, if your son comes to you and asks for bread, you're not going to give him a rock. And if he comes and asks for fish, you're not going to give him a snake. Now, if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? In other words, He loves you. He adores you. Christ died for you. And because of that, you can come before Him and say, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll give what you want me to give. Whatever you ask, Lord, I will do because I love you and I know that you love me. Let's pray. Our Lord, we do thank you that you are a great God who loves his people dearly. Father, we confess that we believe that. We've been confessing it all morning long, and yet we also confess that our faith is weak. We're afraid. We're afraid that you won't do what's best for us. We're afraid that, that you might make us do something we don't want to do. And we are afraid that we know what's better for us than you do. Lord, help us. Help us to trust you. Help us to believe that the cross is real, that the resurrection is real, that the reign of Jesus is real, that the glory to be revealed to come is real. And so, Lord, we pray, help us to live by faith, trusting you. And so, Lord, we pray with weak and feeble faith because you have loved us so dearly because you have given your son for us. We now, O Lord, trust you, and we offer our lives to you. So Lord, we pray. We will do whatever you want us to do. We will go wherever you want us to go. We will give whatever you want us to give. Our lives are yours. We've been bought with a price. Thank you, O Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.